Welcome to the Brothers Zoll Podcast, a show 37 years in the making, hosted by David, John, and Simeon Zoll. Join us as we recreate some of our favorite dinner table discussions from growing up. Talking theology, culture, jokes, and everything in between. When I say the word evil, let's just let's just start there because it's it's not a it's not a it's not a word that modern people are terribly comfortable with at least in my context and I assume in both of your contexts. But when I say the word evil, where does your mind go? Sim. To me, uh I go I go to like supernatural evil uh almost immediately to sort of forces of evil. Sor- Sauron. Uh, Sauron. Yeah. <laughs> The you know um, Halloween kind of kind of time. That's that's where my mind first goes, uh, and then I go sort of the theological place, which is um, that evil's very hard to talk about theologically. Yeah. Why why is that? I mean, what what would you do? People teach courses on just the theology of evil, or is it uh, something that students even ask about these days? Or um, just don't, you don't have to tell me what you think. I just want to know why would you say? Yeah evil is such a hard thing to talk about? The, there are a couple of reasons. One um, is that it ties immediately into one of the most notoriously difficult topics in Christian theology, which is theodicy, which is, is trying to make sense of why why bad things exist in light of the goodness and omnipotence of God. And at one level, it's an insoluble problem, though there have been many, uh, many attempts. So, you, when you're trying to talk about evil in a way that makes sense of it or that justifies it, that, that makes it at least some kind of coherence uh, out of it in, in Christian theological terms, you always feel like you're fighting a, a battle that you have to fight, but you can never quite win. So, so it's intellectually very kind of difficult. But then, so people do want to talk about that a lot. Students are very interested in that, partly because they get worried about just the, it, it ties into the, the a sense of the intellectual um, coherence of Christianity. But at the same time, people don't think of themselves <laughs> as evil, <laughs> particularly, uh, I think, anymore. So it, it's also very abstract sometimes. It's like, the, it's the bad stuff out there. Um, and you can sort of name these kind of, obvious, um, bold-lettered examples, but it, it's actually a little bit removed, I think, at least when it gets discussed from from people's day-to-day lives. I often find that the word evil is used in this very sort of weird general blanket way, where sometimes it's referring to suffering, sometimes it's referring to sin, sometimes it's referring to the fallen world. And I am eager to want to sort of distinguish all four of those categories from each other. So an analogy I sometimes use is imagine you walk onto the beach and there is a sign that says no swimming, dangerous currents, right? I, I, I sort of think, and then the person reads the sign, which is the law and has a strange, counter reaction to the instruction and the sin in them springs to life saying, I bet I could swim in there. And then the person runs into the water at which point they're caught in an undertow and then they drowned. Right now I tend to think that sin is the part of the person that thinks they're more powerful than they are that they can swim where they're told that's not a good idea. And it's the force within us that causes us to want to assert our dominance falsely or, or in a way that is um, actually a misaccurate representation of who we really are. And then getting into the water, right. And, and the undercurrent I think of as being the evil um, that takes you out, that plays upon the weakness of your sin. And that sort of conjoins with the power of the sin in that moment to lure you in. Maybe it's also the voice in your head saying, I bet you could swim in there. Um, the tempter, right. And then I think of you drowned, and right. That's suffering. And, and that's suffering, but not only is that suffering, I would say that is the fallen world. 
right? That doesn't really care whether you live or die. That seems to be fickle about we, your um, flourishing or dying within the whole framework. And so for me, that's kind of a helpful way of distinguishing the roles between them, but that also shows how they all sort of work. I don't know what you guys think of that analogy. Is that helpful? Is that sort of a problematic, Simeon? Just, I think it's helpful. Uh, I think it's a good analogy. I think it's, I think it's useful. I think um, there's going to be some blurriness between those categories. You know, the theologian in me wants to say, well, you know, that, that, the, that that's, it's, it's, it's useful sort of rough and ready typology, but, um, but there's, there's ways in which the, 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 the sin in us is connected to evil and um, uh, that kind of thing, I guess, and, and that we suffer uh, in all, all through all, all the parts of it, but but no, fu- fundamentally, I, I think it's a good analogy. Yeah, the, like the cultural critic in me wants to say that like the, the the discomfort with evil is usually the not wanting to face any kind of malevolent strain within oneself. You know that the actual malice that you you exert sometimes against even your loved ones. And what I've noticed is that um, we want to replace it with empathy, and empathy is great. But um, if you think about it in terms terms of I was I was doing a podcast recently about Marvin Gaye and we were talking about in Tammy Terrell who is his uh, great duet partner did ain't no mountain high enough and all this wonderful work and Tammy Terrell had been in an extremely abusive relationship with James Brown the great the godfather of of soul and also David Ruffin of the Temptations and when you hear about this stuff um what the you know when you hear about David Ruffin going after Tammy Terrell, uh, this beautiful talented young woman with a hammer and hitting her with a hammer, and you hear what James Brown did and you think uh, th- there there's one way to say well these men were possessed and they were there was something evil going on, but I think the the modern tendency maybe not when it comes to uh, bu- abuse, maybe abuse, uh, sort of, especially like uh, abuse of spousal abuse is like kind of exempted. But most of the time, you'd be like, well, what were their limitations that they were working with that somehow fed into this? What was the uh, childhood that? Uh, somehow the, these are men trying to do the best they could or um, but with no, no tools you know you're trying to get behind it to make make it so that somehow what they did was less was more understandable or with using empathy to say well it wasn't actually that bad because it was if they'd had a different childhood it would have been different or if they'd had different, if, if there hadn't been so much systemic racism at the time, it would have been different. If there hadn't been so much sexism, it would have been different. And um, there's a discomfort like that. I'm always interested in the fact. Well, where does empathy end? Like, because if, if there's, if it's, if you can just empathize all evil out of existence, then you don't have to ever forgive anyone for anything. You can just sort of understand it. But um, when it comes to James Brown and, you know, Tammy Terrell and David Ruffin, like, what if there was actually some, something diabolical going on? I, I don't know. How do you account for it otherwise? Um, when, when you come up against something, when you really hear the, the, I, th- I wonder if this is why we're so interested in serial killers, you know, to be honest. Uh, and they, they say sociopaths or what are sociopaths, right? They're people without empathy. And that's why they're capable of doing these terrible things. But, a Christian could say, well, they may not have em- any empathy, but what they're doing is still, they're, they're also evil. Like there, there's an evil uh, component here that's just free floating, malicious, devilish intent that gives you one other arrow in the quiver of explaining what is going on in life, right? These are categories that I, I find it's especially useful to think of them as um, categories for making sense of, of things and, and their value is insofar as they help make sense, better sense than other categories. And like you give it a, a, a good example uh, there. And I think there are, uh, there are things in, in the world that um, maybe less than it felt like there, there were 500 years ago, but there are things in the world that do seem to um, have this kind of, uh, where some kind of a level and agency does seem to um, be a better way of understanding it. So, I mean, it's slightly trivial in a way, but, um, and we talk about powers and principalities uh, in the Bible. I vividly remember I was probably coming into New York for a Mockingbird conference, but I'm um, driving from the airport, uh, having gotten off a plane from England, and that on that sort of kind of 
depressing uh, highway <laughs> that you take from the airport into uh, New York and always takes longer than you want and everything. And But the feeling of sort of seeing Manhattan and then immediately feeling like, I, um, oh gosh, I need to be cool, I need to be stylish, I need to be with it, I need to be at the forefront of, uh, you know, there's a, just a, a, a sense of like, of values like descended almost instantaneously on me and through going back to the time I'd spent in New York and different kinds of things. And I was like, Oh, this is a town that is, that is, that is operating under, um, it's like cloud that you enter. Uh, and I, I find myself thinking thoughts there that I don't think elsewhere or feeling less able to resist certain kinds of things. So uh, that, that's an example. I mean, actually Oxford and Cambridge are the same way in a very different way. People come to these towns and they, get kind of caught by them. They find that, you know, unless I can live and work here, uh, this, is, this is a thing you see a lot when living over here. People fall in love with these towns and they feel like basically any other life would be would be a failure uh, other than a life lived lived here. And that, to me, there's something really pernicious. Uh, and, and yet it happens over and over to all different kinds Praying, of people. It so praying, it prays. That's, that's yeah, another kind of category. Yeah. So I, I find it helpful in thinking about evil. I, I remember, you know, when the little bit of Luther that I've read, he talks about the devil constantly. And um, there was such a belief that there was this kind of active oppositional force that was trying to undermine the bedrock of his faith at every turn. And I remember, I, I, I'm quick to want to apply the category of evil to the the. Um, instance of suicide, um, which is what Luther famously did when he arrived in that first parish, I think in Wittenberg, and one of his parishioners' children uh, killed himself and was hung, right? A, a little, a 15-year-old boy hung himself, and, and Luther then um, buried the boy. And it was a huge outrage at the time because he insisted upon burying uh, the child in the consecrated ground of the graveyard, where at the time... Uh, murder, I mean, suicide was, a, was considered to be equivalent with sin. And so, um, and it was just taught that basically a person who commits suicide goes directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And Luther um, basically dug the grave himself because the gravedigger refused to do it and buried the boy and turned to the crowd who were watching this spectacle. And he said, if this boy had been oven, overtaken by a robber in the woods and killed, he would be allowed to be buried here. Well, I tell you, this boy was murdered in the same fashion by the devil. And I always think about that when I'm dealing with the pastoral instance of suicide, which I hate to say is very common. Um, and I have shared that story with families um, that... How do they respond? Has, um, they appreciate it. It takes things outside of the category of choice and sin, and it puts them more along the line of what Jesus talked about, it, it, sickness and evil and... Um, the person's a victim of something more powerful than them. And I, I find uh, that I always think about that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually an incredibly helpful example too, because people will say that, well, if you, are you saying it's all the devil and, and, or all evil and no sickness, no physiological, biological component? You say, no, that was the, a lot of times when you're that depressed, uh, there it definitely is an inherited medical condition, but that doesn't mean that there's not also um, evil. I think these things can coexist, uh, and that's uh, what was a lot of times people are like, well, because there is a tendency, especially in historically as well as you know as we know in certain Christian traditions, to blame everything you don't want to deal with in yourself, blame it on the devil or the yeah, demons. That, you know that always gets that, under that my skin. That is like. We're not, the three of us is dealing with basically mainline Christianity that does not happen very much in our context. However, it happens in other times, like, well, the devil made me do it. Or let's pray against this as spiritual warfare, where it's like, no, you're just kind of an asshole. You know, it's like that, that's really what's happening. So, um, 
but I don't think these things, again, as Simeon says, there's a blurriness that we have to be on. Uh, I think sometimes to, there, there is no accounting for what just happened outside of, outside of some form of evil. And that's when, like, you watch the movie Psycho or something, and you have, like, normal amounts of sin happening, and then basically evil comes into the picture and you're like oh my goodness this this these 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 small like stealing money you know having affairs then 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 like malicious predatory death dealing uh you know evil comes in and that's also psychological and it's not completely outside that's one of the great things about that movie i think it's so i don't know i guess as the older i get the more you realize some of these categories are intertwined and that's okay I find, I mean, the more we talk about it, the more I find myself thinking of the devil as sometimes he's referred to as the seducer. And I just think about this kind of baiting mm, that sort of the accuser. preys upon our weakness and in our weakest moments um, sort of presents us with the worst possible uh, option that then our weak, sinful nature seizes upon. And the outcropping is um, catastrophe. And it's a sort of place where our sin and the devil's seduction have come together uh, yeah. in a devastating consequence. And that, Dave, your, I mean, the, the point of saying that these things can, can coexist and can be, you know, there can be multiple things that are genuinely going on here and that need to be understood, that helps you get out of the potential problem of, of just getting rid of all possible uh, blame or saying it's, oh, it's all, all the blame is external. Uh, you can say the blame genuinely is somewhat external in, in a way that I can, can grant empathy and, uh, and also give a kind of way of dealing with it. You know, people pray in those contexts a lot. Um, uh, and there's something about that kind of prayer, I think, that is very powerful um, to people. But it, it avoids that sort of either or, mm-hmm. what, you're, what you're saying. It's interesting that we're so focused on, I mean, we, how much media is about real evil, <laughs> you know, is about serial killers and, and, and monsters. And, you know, the, the horror genre famously just is, is just keeps, uh, keeps making money for people. Yeah, I mean, that's the great question about horror films. It's always the question. It's like, what purpose does this actually serve? By wh- wh- why, what is it appealing to? How can and people who really like horror films are constantly called upon to justify their love of horror films. Like what? Because some people just have a knee jerk aversion to it, and I know people that are like watching that kind of movie. That's that's an evil movie, and then other people who seem to be if anything, it's a way into the supernatural and to talk about stuff that's outside, you know, with the, the imminent frame as they call it. And like, that's a, uh, people have a sense that there are things going on that you cannot see as we talked, we've talked about before. And this is a way to, to, um, I don't know, to project some of that or to allow it to have some distance from you. Because horror movies, this is another thing. I mean, the three of us were brought up with a father who loves horror movies, sort of B horror movies. We, he wasn't exposing us to like what we call like splatter films or the this, this stuff that is maybe torturous that, but still lots of good and evil, uh, Dracula monsters, um, hammer horror films. Do you think that had an impression on you growing up or how to, how has it had an impression on you if at all? So, um, I think it's had a huge impression and in a funny way, a very positive impression. And, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of recreating that to some degree in my own way with my kids. We just, um, played Castlevania two, uh, Belmont's quest or Simon's quest, uh, together. It was sort of me getting them into that world of my childhood that was meaningful to me. There's sort of two things I would want to say about that. One, um, I think, Oh, the, the world of, of a certain kind of horror, the world of Castlevania, the world of vampires and, and ghouls and ghosts, or, uh, you know, generally speaking, and this is what Dad was always interested in, uh, horror that essentially takes place within, I would say, a Christian metaphysic. So it's a world in which there is, there is good and evil and good wins. There are certain kinds of tools that tend to be Christian tools very often, you know, crosses. And... My world is waiting for you. Or seek the cross so that you can join me there. Garlic, holy, whatever it is. Holy water. Holy water. There you go. Um, the, the priest is needed to, you know, cast out the thing. You know that that. So that's a world of, of horror that, to me, is really not 
bad actually and can can it, it teaches you about an enchanted world that the world it, it somehow it gives you access to uh, to, you know, to remythologizing the world in a certain kind of way, and we respond to it very strongly. But I also find I, I have very little time for horror that doesn't operate within that kind of metaphysics that's just nihilistic. And there's a lot of that out there that's just about let's watch people get murdered and tortured or um, or where there's no nothing redemptive. Um, the ghosts are just there and they're evil and all you can do is try to stay away. You know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I find I do I don't like that stuff. I don't get much out of it, and so there's something cathartic or and reenchanting I think about it. But it all depends on on what the framework is in which the evil is understood, um, and uh, so that's why I like you know, in Castlevania you go to the church to get healed, um, you go to the graveyard to uh, you know for something to happen, but you don't. Um, go to the, the torture house. Yeah, this is the story of our upbringing. Our father introduced us to basically all of the both sci-fi and especially horror movies that took place within a Christian context and wherein Christianity ultimately wins. And I would say that we, he never showed us a single nihilistic horror movie. Um, always, you know, the classic one is... We, we weren't allowed to see The Wicker Man. The cl- yeah, exactly. Well, the classic ones were all the Hammer Horror films, which often, um, like, the famous one is The Devil Rides Out. We always had that joke, remember? Um, Just as I suspected, Christopher Lee says. They say, what is it? And he says... The Clavicule of Solomon, <laughs> which is some book he <laughs> discovers in this old mansion, which lets him know that, in fact, there are cultic practices at play in that house and that they're having seances. And in that movie, right, the whole story ends with a, a devil worshiping cult trying to sacrifice a little girl. And then um, the Holy Spirit literally descends and the shrouds are ripped off of the, uh, the stained glass windows in the back and the light of Christ pours through and exorcism occurs. And Jesus is the vanquisher of the devil worshipers in that devilish moment. And the whole thing, in fact, takes place in a church that they had turned into their devil worshiping sanctuary. Um, and like, that's the classic, you know, horror movie that, I remember watching as a kid. Um, and to this day, I love supernatural horror because I really believe, you know, that there's a supernatural element to life, but I'm not, I don't like supernatural horror that ends with evil winning. And that's sort of unfortunately more and more common, I would say, in a lot of horror movies. Or like an ambivalent ending. That, like like yeah. It's a very common now that like the, the good guys win and then there's a final shot of like the hand grabbing, you know, the the the, the cliff edge or something like that. Oh, it hasn't actually yeah, been killed. Yeah, it hasn't actually been killed. That's common. Yeah. The other thing, there's a whole, there's so many genres within horror. And um, so I like supernatural horror for all the reasons Simeon mentioned. They're sort of dealing with a Christian metaphysic where hopefully good forces ultimately conquer over evil forces. That's what I'm looking for in a good horror movie. The greatest example I would say of all time and the archetype of this Christian metaphysic in cinema would be Friedkin's The Exorcist, which I think most people hail. Uh, I rewatched The Shining recently. Here's Johnny. This may be controversial, um, but I showed it to my daughter who has a very healthy appetite for horror movies and for an eight-year-old girl is surprisingly unafraid maybe it's because i built up her tolerance the way dad did with us but she for example watched jaws and her response when the the shark finally emerges at the end of the movie she said oh he's cute right um <laughs> and so anyway we we showed our daughter the shining and um, her babysitter told her oh you should see the shining it's a movie about a guy who goes crazy right and you know, The Shining for most adults is the most horrifying movie. Uh, it freaks people out um, because it has that deep, ominous mood. But you actually almost have to be an adult to sense the evil that is present in the lurking world of the uh, Outlook Hotel as you're watching it. Um, but it's a great horror movie to show a kid for a few reasons. One, there are no pop out, jump out, scary things. That's what a kid thinks is scariest in a movie. There's none of that in the movie. It's just this ominous, dark brooding mood that's building. But the second thing is at the end of the movie, and I, I'm total spoiler alerts. If you haven't seen The Shining, you know, I'm stop I listening to this you. podcast yeah. and like, uh, go, go watch it. Yeah. So at the end of The Shining, the little boy lives. The mommy who's been trying to protect the little boy not only lives, but is able to protect the child. 
the bad guy who's taken over by evil Jack Nicholson gets his, which is essential for there being any sense of redemption in that movie and closure. But most importantly, one person does die. It's the old man, remember, who drives through the snow to get there. And he knows he's going to die and he knows what's going on. And he's basically willingly giving his life to save the mother and son who then have a snowmobile with which they can leave. So it's yeah. pure atoning uh, sacrifice on top of it all. So it's like kids don't die, mommy doesn't die, evil gets it, and atoning sacrifice saves the day. Well, I was thinking about this also in terms of possession. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, uh, you know, a lot of times whenever you get into the demonology in the New Testament, and I've had to preach on it a number of times because you can't really dodge it. It's so central to what Jesus was about that um, uh, people like look at the... Jesus' interactions with demons, and, and they think, oh, that's just uh, mental health problems that people had. And I always find that to be interesting in that it, it's, uh, you know, what is a lot of mental health issues, if you break them down, it's like, well, there's something that is occupying this person that does seems to have not their best interest at heart, and they're under assault. You know, that's you always hear that, that people are under assault, they're possessed by something. And how is that that different from a conception of a demon outside of there's no cultural baggage of the horns and the red, you know, things. And I, I mean, I, I always think of, um, you know, John, you talked about suicide. I think a common way to talk about it also is in terms of addiction, of people being possessed by something that's stronger than they are. And that may not be, the, again, it may, it's not, it may not be the only thing going on. There may be genetic and circumstantial factors. But to think about this um, Chris Arnade wrote this wonderful book called Dignity a couple of years ago in which he sort of really delved into back row America and the people, the sort of deplorables of the world and, and really the, the, the drug addicts and the, and in this South Bronx and things like that. And this is one thing he wrote, he said, um, cause he thought as an, he was an atheist at the time. He said, I thought I'd go into this neighborhood where there's so much suffering and so much pain and so little opportunity and think that everyone had ceased believing in God, that there was a hopelessness. But he said, I actually found that everyone had a very active faith in God, no matter who they were or what they looked like. That, 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 that involves like the, the cross-dressing prostitutes just as much as sort of the uh, drunks who can't get out of their box that they're living under the bridge. He said, he said this, he said, mixed with faith in God is a strong belief in the reality of evil. Crossing the bridge into Hunt's Point Takesha looks out the window of my van. This place is so bad and evil. It's like so simple to walk across the bridge, but it's like you can't go across. You understand? This place is evil. It's possessed. It's evil. I've been here a long time. There are bad spirits here. I've seen good people. I've seen people that have family jobs and they come here and they get dug in and two weeks later they're living in a cardboard box. Steve, uh, who is also with him, listens and agrees, saying this place is haunted. It pulls you in and chews you up. I was like five years in jail, and when I was released, I came back here, and the first day I was doing crack. One day back, you keep coming back to it. Hunt's Point is for devils. And then he, Arnaid finishes by saying, when you're up against evil, whether the mysterious efforts of demons or the all too explainable effects of drugs, the front row world, that sort of the ed educated worlds of science, education, and smart arguments doesn't do much for you. Huh. That's good. I still think that sin is an important category to differentiate from evil. Uh, and that, that sin is sort of like um, our own tendency to... Uh, defeat ourselves and that the devil may use alcohol to bait sin in the case of the alcoholic who has a, I would say, biological predisposition to metabolize alcohol in a different way from a non-alcoholic so that a person who is not an alcoholic can drink safely and without it causing harm. Um, and so you have like a sort of version of sin in one person that you don't have in another. Usually I find people are, use evil as an excuse to avoid looking at their own sin, which is the main area that our Book of Common Prayer tradition is much more interested in, right? We come to church, we don't really talk about evil. We don't really worry about evil in our worship because we believe that ultimately Christ on the cross has disarmed the powers of evil. But we do believe very much that sin is a prevalent 
and um, relevant encompassing problem that we are all dealing with on a week in and week out basis. And to the extent that we are not acknowledging the gravity of that and say, instead pointing our fingers outward, uh, we do ourselves a massive psycho spiritual disservice. That's almost, that's almost the sum of uh, politics these days. Like, uh, you know, it's pointing outward those people over there, but Sim, you've talked, I mean, you're, you're kind of an expert on this. Like uh, you've given a talk of mockingbird about sin and, and you uh, have written an amazing article about it. How do you talk about sin? We- so, Sin, um, I'm, I'm extremely interested in the fact that it's very hard to talk well about sin uh, in the contemporary world, at least in, in the kind of world that the, the three of us spend our lives in. Um, and uh, people find it very uncomfortable. They associate it with judgmentalism or with um, you know, lack, of, lack of empathy, lack of understanding. It's a way of, of, of being critical of other people rather than doing the, the sort of harder work of, of having compassion and understanding where they're coming from, like you were talking about earlier, Dave. Um, and it's also caught up a lot sort of semantically with um, ideas about sex that people don't like. So uh, there's a, a lot of reasons why people don't like those terms anymore. And yet we're in a world where surround, just pathology has not gone away and deep problems have not gone away. And um, and I don't think that you don't have to make that case anymore. But um, so I think it's actually really interesting to talk about sin now as a, as a, as a category, as a way of making sense of uh, of the things that have gone wrong in the world, both for, within us and um, outside of us. So um, I find that you know that's a, to me that's like a really kind of an exciting creative challenge is to figure out how to do that well um, in, in Christian terms. But I think here again, I mean, not to be sort of too meta about it, but I think of all these things are you know they're categories that are useful for making sense of things. And, that, and, and, and that's, I mean that in a strong way, like that they, you know, to make sense of it. And Christianity has these categories that just have a depth and a texture that other forms of explanation don't have. So when you can talk about sin and evil and compassion and the goodness of creation all at the same time, you have the resources for an extremely kind of rich, multi-layered, um, uh, way of analyzing what's actually happening in the world. And so there are cases where, you know, so to me, John, the, the people who, who are, who are always attributing things to evil, I don't come across as much, uh, in my environment. There are many people like that out there in my environment. Often it might be a useful term for people to reintroduce to their vocabulary, the possibility that there might be something beyond just what they see with their eyes. Um, on the other hand, there'd be other contexts where it's, well, maybe let's talk about sin. I mean, that's what Christoph Blumhart did to his father. His father's ministry was all of, I wrote this book on a 19th century German kind of faith healer and his father, and their, their whole story began with an exorcism. And the father started this movement in 1842 in Southern Germany about uh, a fight against the forces of, of, uh, of darkness, of, of uh, finstonness, as he, as he said. And, um, and then the son came 40 years later and said, well, maybe now we need to focus on sin rather than, rather than the shadow. Uh, and the new battle is against ourselves uh, in our sin. It's a remarkable sort of um, sequence, but I just, but in a way, it, it, at different times, different things were needed, um, and I think that's that's part of how I see these these categories. Not that they don't actually refer to real things, but that how useful they are in a given situation uh, depends on the situation. Sim, you wrote in that same in that one article about um, hiding in plain sight. I love. Um, I'm going to read two paragraphs from it to quote you back to yourself. And John, I'd love to hear what you think about this. Uh, He says, Christianity has a term for the way in which the world is full of big, complex evils like sexism, racism, you know, uh, materialism. And that term is sin. And this might be a good opening. Certainly it would get the world listening. The problem with this strategy is that it carries substantial risks of your audience missing the point. Most college students, like most human beings, think of racism and misogyny and capitalist misbehavior as bad things that people out there do. Other people, maybe people we know, but definitely not us. Many are aware that they are victims of such things, and they are, but almost none of them would think of themselves as participants or perpetrators. And then you kind of go, you go all the way to sort of defining the sin. She said, you say the doctrine of sin is a way of saying that reality is like a lens with a subtle but pervasive flaw, such that everything that goes through it gets distorted. 
Plans go wrong, communications fail, good intentions decay and corrupt. And of describing the fact that in so many things that happen, there's a, this slight tilt towards the perverse and the cruel. In other words, is it, it is a description of the fact that there is a fundamental bias against flourishing that appears to be written into our hearts. So we have to think of sin as a condition. It is like gravity, only it causes enormous suffering. See, Dave, this is why I find podcasts really hard. I always sort of end up just sort of stumbling through saying badly things that I maybe said better somewhere else. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, in fact, you call it a load-bearing um, doctrine in the Christian faith. that You can't really talk about uh, a, a physician without sickness, or you, you can't talk about a, a helper without those in need of help. And um, you just like you can't talk about a, you know, uh, God without the devil, is, is there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a piece missing. So, I don't know. What, John, what else do you think? I tend to think of sin as being a whole other category that's much easier to talk about than evil, um, and that has to do much more with the instinct within us that comes sort of from the fall, we could say, uh, to play God ourselves rather than to allow God to be in charge of our lives. And so I think of it basically as self-interest and um, self-protective instinct and the ways in which those things things play out. But also I think of both sin and evil as being powers. And what's so helpful about the Christian interpretive categories of sin and evil is that they're more powerful than the individual. And this notion that we're sort of being played upon by these forces is one that I find to be really compelling and actually that explains much more of the data than the notion that the world tends to operate within, which is like people are making choices and they're in control of what they're doing. And to me, so much of what's going on in this world is basically predetermined by our sinfulness and the ways in which the devil baits those tendencies and instincts within individuals. And I find that that explains the majority of people's stories, at least the defining moments, uh, much more than, say, focusing on virtue and the positives and believing that humans are primarily good and all of those kinds of ideas that sound nice and I would say are very romantic. But really, when you embrace the idea of an all-loving, all-powerful God who is truly good, um, I find that... Uh, it frees me to own up to my frailty and weakness. Part of why I'm interested in in, in sin, in particular, as a topic, you know, theologically and otherwise, is, be, is is it's completely because to me it's useful, it's helpful, it's powerful. It, it gives us it's a way of understanding ourselves, having compassion on ourselves, uh, and seeing truth about ourselves. So it's it's not just some kind of a theory that I want to be true because I'm committed to it because I'm a Christian or something. It, it's just, it, it's so useful. Um, and I'm like, I, thank goodness I have this category to help me um, make sense of myself. And it prevents despair um, to me, actually, having a, an account. Because if you don't have an account of sin, then you can't have an account of, of redemption. Um, and uh, there's, some, there's something hopeful, actually, uh, about sin when it's talked about properly. I totally agree. And that has been my experience as well, uh, you know, at a gut level. Um, it, as long as I tried to sort of, you know, fight those, th that interpretation, I was basically living in denial. And the moment I accepted that interpretation of things, I found that I had entered a whole new world where grace was a possibility and where um, deliverance was um, a category that was totally new and basically coming in from the outside and made sense of all so much of the like good things that had happened in my life, you know, with interventions and with um, outside aid and all these things. It does bear mentioning that as much as we sort of love talking about sin, or at least it's it's proven helpful, true, and, you know, healing, um, there are many people out there for whom it's the worst word ever because it's basically synonymous, as Simeon says, with self-loathing. 
and with um, you're worthless. And uh, we, we would say it's, a, I w- I've always found it to be an engine of compassion and understanding. But for some people out there, it's been a, it's been a real, it's been u- misused as a bludgeon and a weapon and, and, and a, as a hierarchical thing. These people are less sinful than those people. And that's something that constantly, so when I'm talking about sin with, with, people in my orbit or parishioners when I'm writing about it, I have to be cognizant of the fact that depending on where they're coming from, they may have, they may think of this as the worst thing in the world and something that has been used against them. Honestly, they've been abused by it, or they, there's someone that needs to be an avenue for humility. And that's where we find uh, God, you know, and that's what we're, what we're talking about. So anyway, that's um, really accurate. And I find that helpful. I basically yeah. help people to sort of buy in to the ideas without labeling them because I know <laughs> that they're so loaded in so many cases. I think part of why we maybe have and have and grew up with or, or found natural a healthy view of sin, there is just in the core kind of grammar of, of Christian thought that, yeah, the creation is good. And human beings are good, and every person is infinitely valuable in the sight of God. And uh, I think those who have a more sort of healthier views, and maybe it's just so obvious that that's the case, that we take that for granted, uh, and that therefore, and that sin is, is still totally true, but it's never such that, therefore, you're worthless, uh, you know, or, or you're, 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 you really don't deserve love. And I, so I think a lot of people can counter it without uh, the, the, the goodness um, that, that for us has maybe often been implicit, but but is totally there, and that's why it's a healing category, or at least a, a yeah. beginnings of healing. This is I find that it's it's so often mischaracterized the position as being either you believe people are entirely good or they're entirely evil, and the believing in sin does not mean believing that people are entirely evil. It means believing that there's no part of them that is not tinged with self interest, basically. Uh, and, and so it's there, basically, I like the words in the Book of Common Prayer in the 39 articles that refer to it as an infection. If a body has an infection, it does not mean that the entire body is the infection, but the infection does have sway over the functioning of every aspect of the body and has implications upon that system. And that's how I, I think of sin. I personally, when we talk about the devil and or we talk about sin because of my sort of Christian faith and the way I make sense of this stuff, I have to be honest, I don't worry too much about this stuff. Like, and I probably would say I, I worry more about sin than the devil, but I really believe that the devil has been beaten in some, this is when I like the category of Christus Victor on the cross, you know, that, that with death being conquered, the devil's worst trick has been outdone, you know? And so I, Sometimes we'll talk to parishioners who are very worried about their child being in some type of environment that they're worried will have baleful impact because of possible evil lurking there. You know, and my instinct as a clergyman, to be honest, is to encourage them to um, be less afraid and to be more trusting in God's prevalence and ability to um, be the determining factor. Um, over and against their fears. And so I, I honestly don't worry that much about the devil. Um, Simeon. It's, it's worth saying, I mean, that, that um, there's a long tradition of, um, you know, the, the classical Western or Latin theological understanding of evil is that it has no substance. It doesn't, in a way, it doesn't exist. It's just disordered good. That there's no, when you actually, there's no there, there. That's Augustine's view. Evil is a privation of good, he famously says. And um, so I was just actually teaching Julian of Norwich, a 14th century mystic, first woman to write a book in the English language, um, and was preparing for some teaching on her recently. And she has this lovely stuff where sort of, she says she goes to God and, and wants to see things from his perspective. And, and he looks down and she says, but he, he doesn't see the sin. He just doesn't see it. His vision is just not even there. And she found that hugely comforting. So there's something, because it has no real substance, um, in, in God's eyes, it's, it's not even there. And in the context of a sort of heavily worried about hell kind of medieval world, that must have been enormously um, comforting. But it's, it's similar to what, you were, what you're saying, John.
Um, so I was going to read you a different angle, right? That this comes from Frank Limehouse, and it's a sermon he preached years and years ago in Birmingham, Alabama. Let's see the date of it. It was preached during Lent in 2010, March 7th. And he has this amazing line that I always think about when the topic of the devil and evil comes up. He says, quote, I can't tell you what the devil looks like. In my own mind, he wears red tights, has horns and a tail, and carries a pitchfork. Other than in the Garden of Eden, in which he is described as crafty and subtle, and Ezekiel, who tells us he was perfect in beauty, I cannot talk so much about what the devil looks like. But what we can talk about is how the devil operates. St. Peter said, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Interestingly, the devil doesn't come at you only when you're weak. He's very interested in your gifts and strengths. This is where we are most vulnerable. The woman with a charming smile is tempted to get away with murder. The salesman with the gift of persuasion is often tempted to, quote, take them for what they're worth. God, on the other hand, is most interested in what? Your weaknesses. The Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What do you guys think about that? That the devil primarily preys upon not our weaknesses, but actually our strengths. I find that to be a really important idea to bring to the conversation. Gosh, I find it tremendously compelling. I find it tremendously compelling because I think that our, in fact, if you think about it, and I, again, I always have to, my culture of goggles on, the, the division and if the, you know, the devil is seen as the divider and the isolator, the division is always about our strengths. It's like, uh, these are, um, these people are good at this and those people are good at that. And, um, and, and everyone has different strengths, but um, we all have very similar weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. Meaning yeah. We're all pretty. Uh, we're all going to die. Is that's a one big weakness? Our bodies are all failing, and we the the, the shape of jealousies, um, pe- petty, m- m- malicious acts towards one another, and the sort of self interest angle is fairly similar in a lot of cases. And yet that doesn't mean like, I, I'm not a fast runner, uh, but I, uh, I, I, I see those people over there. They can, uh, you know, I was running this morning. That's what I'm thinking about it. Cause I saw there are some guys that are like really fast runners. Like I'm never going to be that fast of a runner. But at the end of the workout, all of us were like, gosh, I'm really tired. My body is, is done. And th- that we were bonded in our exhaustion, but we were separated in our strength. And uh, so I see that as, as tremendously true. And because, um, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about and writing about is this sort of how low anthropology and sin, suffering, evil, this, this cocktail is actually um, the beginning of a gracious understanding of, of like, and a unifying understanding of people. And I think that the, yeah, the strengths are are a problem. I mean, our (laughs) our strengths often lead us to be self-righteous, right? And the moment we become self-righteous, we become differentiated from our fellow human beings. And I mean, Jesus, we know, I think the primary issue he took with people, it it was self-righteousness. That was the thing that seemed to irk him more than any other trait. And there's so much teaching. I mean, just pride just almost has no footing in the Christian faith. And I think in some ways... It's because of these issues that we're talking about. I think that's hugely powerful and true. The uh, in the where and anyone, if you look back on sort of periods of your life where you were unhappy, often it's because you were attached to some idea about some strength of yours, or something that you thought should happen, something that you deserved, or um, and uh, it's really not hard to find examples of people where it's like, gosh, it was so freeing to have failed. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was so freeing when that just didn't work out or or why was I obsessed with that thing for so long, um, that kept me from doing other things. And it often is, it has to do with this sort of strengths, ideas about yourself and it cuts you off from other people. It makes you self-obsessed. It makes you resentful, uh, all all those things. Whereas your weakness is, is the best thing in the world. I found that in ministry in college. I just, I, I found ministry really meaningful and sort of easy in a way with all these freshman guys, uh, in this Bible study I had at, um, at Harvard a long time ago now, but the, uh, because it was just, 
I, I was just so, it was so clear, my failings about my, my inability to get work done, you know, all sorts of things, my complete terror of women. Uh, these were all things that just made so much sense to me and they all related. And so I could just be compassionate with them and it was a joy. Um, whereas if I'd gotten obsessed with sort of who was smartest or something, that would have been just the opposite. It would have been divisive and, uh, and not birthing of love. You know, I think we're going to, I think we're probably getting close to the end here, but I always want to remember what, when Flannery O'Connor was asked what, what was the subject of her fiction? Uh, the great quote was that she said, is the, the action of grace in a territory occupied largely by the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's, if you read her stories, that's sort of what it's about. And that grace often takes a sort of a violent form. And it, John, it, 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 it touches on the distinction between suffering and, and uh, sin in a, in a great way and evil in a great way. Um, um, can I read you a quote from Hooker that relates to that? That's just sure. amazing. This is uh, Richard Hooker, a famous Anglican theologian who um, lots of people, he's a little like the sort of low grade version of Augustine in that like any theologian can look to hooker to justify whatever it is that they're interested in. Um, <laughs> but he's got a lot of sway in this sort of world of Anglicanism. And, uh, he's said so many good things and this is totally to our point. Listen to this. He says, my eager protestations made in the glory of my ghostly strength. I am ashamed of but those crystal tears wherewith my sin and weakness was bewailed have procured my endless joy. My strength hath been my ruin and my fall my stay. Um, you know, this is clearly a subject about which uh, we're not going to exhaust. As Simeon said, it's hard to talk about. One of the reasons it's hard to talk about is you can constantly think of caveats and qualifiers and additions and, and all these things. So this is really just meant as a kind of a, a time to riff on this. But I, I thought we'd close with one uh, quote from Gerhard Ferde, the Lutheran theologian. We've read some things, and this is, this is a fantastic. And it's from On Being a Theologian of the Cross. And it really has to do with the danger of rolling suffering into evil. This is what he says. He says, contemporary theologians talk much about the problem of evil. Some think it is the most difficult problem for theology today and one of the most persistent causes of unbelief. Since suffering is itself classified as evil, it is, of course, simply lumped together with disaster, crime, misfortune of every sort, abuse, holocaust, and all manner of notorious wrong as one and the same problem. Evil does cause suffering, but not always. Indeed, the usual complaint is that the evil don't seem to suffer. I mean, that's the Psalms, right? However, the causes of suffering may not always be evil. Perhaps not even most of the time. Love can cause suffering. Beauty can be the occasion for suffering. Children with their demands and impetuous cries can cause suffering. Just the toil and trouble of daily life can cause suffering, and so on. Yet these are surely not to be termed evil. The problem of suffering should not be just rolled up with the problem of evil. And then he goes further. He says, identification of suffering with evil has the further result that God must be absolved from all blame. Thus, the theologian of glory adds to the uh, perfidy of false speech by trying to assure us that God, of course, has nothing to do with suffering and evil. God is, quote unquote, good, the rewarder of all our, quote unquote, good works, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of merit. Meanwhile, suffering goes on unabated. Well, if God has nothing to do with suffering, what is he involved with? Whoever does not know God hidden in suffering, Luther asserts in his proof, does not know God at all. Oh, I just, I love that because I find that so much of what the Christian faith is about is enabling us to face and endure um, the experience of uh, sort of losing our own self-interest and that that feeling and experience is very painful. Uh, and yet it is also incredibly life-giving. It's like Eustace in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader or the Sil when, when Aslan peels the scales from him and it hurts, but it's a delicious pain. And so much of Christian experience is actually l tied together with suffering. But a lot of that is n in no way um, evil. And so I love the idea of salvaging the the 
helpful and positive experience of kind of shedding our uh, self-interest. Yeah. You know, but I thought maybe we could end with, uh, you know, we've talked about horror movies. We've talked about uh, music, of course, or we've, that that's been in the background. Are there any uh, bits of, what is it called? Uh, you know, works of uh, cult, uh, cultural artifacts that you might recommend in relation to this topic. Uh, I'll go last, but uh, is anything spring to mind? It doesn't have to be the best thing ever. Yeah, so I'd recommend too uh, the, the old one that I mentioned earlier, The Devil Rides Out, is an mm -hmm. old Hammer horror film that has wonderful Christian themes and is also very amusing uh, with that great quote about the clavicule of Solomon. Um, and has it stars Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. I mean, imagine those two great actors together. Um, but the more modern movie that's really off the beaten path and so good on all of these topics and deeply interested in applying Christian categories to this material is called The Addiction by Abel Ferrara who uh, famously made like the movie Bad Lieutenant. And that movie stars a uh, pretty famous actress. But um, this woman, it, she plays a PhD student studying existentialism at Columbia, who is bitten by a vampire in the East Village one night, and then undergoes the experience of becoming a vampire and being overtaken by evil. And it uses the analogy of vampirism for addiction and ultimately culminates in true Christian deliverance that mm -hmm. is um, including a quotation from a vampire to another vampire by R.C. Sproul. It is just not to be believed. So <laughs> the addiction by Abel Ferrara plus Cypress Hill and Onyx did the soundtrack. <laughs> Sim, you got anything? Um... I think so. I, I recently got, went through a phase of reading the the, the Dennis Wheatley novels because uh, he, he was a, he was hugely successful, especially in this country and uh, somewhat forgotten. Uh, and there's a whole range of novels: The Haunting of Toby Jug, uh, The De Devil Rides Out. Those those are those are wonderful. They're sort of rollicking adventure stories in which um, there really is supernatural evil, and it really is defeated largely on kind of Christian terms. And so. Uh, those those speak to me. Um, beyond that, I of course think of, of the Exorcist as the the the, the ultimate statement. Mm, agreed. Uh, for, in Christian terms, on on this subject, um, but that's that's all I got. The power of Christ compels you. What about M. R. I, James? I, I, to, I get my recommendations from you what guys. What about M. R. James? Remember growing up in our household? Oh, M. R. James. Yes. People probably don't know who he is. He was a Cambridge academic and also the um, head of Eaton College at, for a while, who wrote these ghost these are the best ghost stories ever written, pretty much. Um, and they're all caught up with sort of the England's. Uh, spiritual and religious past. There's always a, um, you know, it's a, a grove of yew trees gothic. or a ruin or a well or something. Um, and they're, they're just absolutely perfect because he gets, he shows you just the right amount of the monster, basically amongst many other things, the perfect atmosphere and everything, but he, he, no one has ever done it better that he it gives you enough to really scare you, but not so much that that it stops being scary. Mm. Um, and yeah, absolutely. The t stories of, uh, MR James. So for me, it's books more. Yeah. I mean, when I think of, uh, books that, uh, this is one of the reasons why I love Stephen King. I think that he, there's at least some of the novels have amazingly, uh, compelling visions of evil and the stand is probably right yeah. at the very top of it as well as it. I mean, um, Pennywise character is something that I, I sort of think of as pure evil in a way, but there, there's there's more of an actual devil character who's less of a, a, a boogeyman and more of an actual devil character, the Randall Flagg in the uh, the Stand, which I think is uh, and, and to very, read very the good. Stand during a pandemic too. I mean, I started thinking about it the moment everything hit. It's a great read. And you you just referenced The Shining earlier, so I guess that I guess that's a. I always think of that as Kubrick, not as uh, Stephen King. <clears throat> Um, but there's a, there's a comic book I love, uh, called Astro City, which did a whole long series about a, a Catholic priest who becomes a vampire and is, and ends end up, uh, doing good, but he's suffering this, you know, he's wearing a cross all the time. So he's constantly suffering. I find that to be very compelling. It's called Confession, Astro City. It's, it's not one that many people have read. Um, 
And then I always, whenever I think of the devil, I always think of the in excess song, the devil inside. I just, every single one of us, the devil inside, which it's kind of conflates all of these things together, but with an amazing beat and, uh, you know, all of the great stuff that we love. So that's just a very tip of the iceberg. Maybe we'll include some of those in the show notes, but, um, this has been, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you could say it's been a blast talking about evil, sin, and suffering, but I think it's been, uh, I always learned something from the two of you, and um, I, I'm grateful for your time doing this today, and I hope that uh, you don't encounter too much evil, sin, and suffering uh, th- these next few hours, at least, uh, even even within yourself. So, there you go. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks, Dave. Words, weapons, sharpen the knives Makes you wanna have the other half die Other half die Makes you wonder, wonder, wonder Well, you come the man With a look in his eye Fair on nothing but full of pride. Look at him go, look at him kick. Makes you wonder how the other half lives. Devil inside, the devil inside. Every single one of us, the devil inside, devil inside. Thanks so much for listening to us do our thing. We hope you've enjoyed it. We do invite you to leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts if you've enjoyed this. And please tell your friends about it. Audio production was provided by TJ Hester. And you can find Mockingbird on the web at www.mbird.com. See you next time. (laughs) 